Hello everyone, this is Chrononauts, a science fiction literature history podcast, and this is bonus episode number two, where Nate and I relax and just shoot the breeze about everything we've done and what we're doing and what we're going to do and whatever else pops into our heads. Yeah. Uh, we think it's good to do this kind of thing every now and then. This is only our second bonus episode, and we do think we'll do more of these as time goes on and maybe branch out a little bit into uh, other areas every now and then that are not the normal purview of Chrononauts. So definitely look forward to more of these in the future. So how are things going down there in New Jersey now? Going pretty good. Yeah. Weather's getting rather warm. Yeah. Nate and I are, are um, most people probably know this, but we're not in the same geographic location. And we met in person several times, but I'm in uh, Canada, and Nate is down there in New Jersey. I have my living space here with an air conditioning unit that I have to turn off when we start the thing. Uh, you're recording in a hot attic. Yeah, it's not too bad now, but I'm sure no. when we do the next couple episodes, it'll get a little warmer. Yeah, I think I think when we were doing the Star Sci episode last year and the the first short story episode, it was probably pretty steamy oh, yeah. up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Back then, that, that was a short story episode was our longest to that point. That was episode number four. And since then, they just seem to be getting longer. So, I mean, when we finished, I remember feeling when we finished wrapping up that one, and I thought to myself, oh, man, that was a really long episode. And yeah. We've done quite a bit longer since then, actually. Yeah, for sure. The last one we did, actually, episode 15, is our longest to date. We're recording this in between episodes 15 and 16. I, mean, I guess the last one we did, the last bonus episode, was in between episodes six and seven. So it's been about ten episodes or so since we we've done one of these. That's right. Yes, and so we have we have fifteen episodes total. I guess I, I kind of feel like we lost count at some point because we decided to split the last two up. Yeah, but we split up episode fourteen as well. So really, that was one recording block. Technically, Technically, I guess we have 14 recording blocks and 15 right. episodes. Yeah. So it's getting confusing, and that is actually <laughs> one thing that uh, one thing that I wanted to bring up to start with this. So we've been doing this for a bit. In the beginning, we certainly didn't have very many regular listeners, and I think we have a few now. And definitely, feedback is something that we do sort of seek out. I know how it is on the internet. You know, people are sometimes reluctant to to comment on stuff that they're watching and listening and. Sometimes, to be fair, platforms don't really make it easy for you. Yeah. Having to do things like go through CAPTCHAs just to make comments and stuff is a little bit antithetical to the whole idea of making it easy for people to leave feedback. And, of course, I understand why some of them have to do it, because there's a lot of abuse on there. But, I don't know, one of the platforms that we do make use of is YouTube. And people say not to look at YouTube comments, but, yeah, sometimes with good channels and stuff, I do find myself engaging with the comments more than I would have expected a couple of years ago. And there's something of a community going on there too. So I, I'm enjoying finding out about that. And I think it's a good platform for us. But we have decided, or we had sort of decided in between the last two episodes that we would split up the actual files when we do a recording block. Because my feeling, and, and I think some others' feelings, were that listening to a three plus hour podcast is not necessarily a problem for everybody, but most people would do it with breaks in between different parts. And unfortunately, some of these online platforms don't make it too easy to time index either. So even with the timestamps, it's hard to actually get to the place that you want to get to. And a lot of them, for example, the players, a lot of people listen on free players like the Spotify player and stuff like that. When you back out of the app, it will just stop and it won't resume where you left off. And I know, speaking for myself, I don't really use any apps, although I just got a new phone, so I might that might be in my future. But even just going to the Anchor website, just finding our podcast on there, which is no problem, but I cannot fast forward or rewind. So I guess, and we've already had a little bit of feedback, and I think that some people prefer one way and some people prefer the other way. So I really don't know which way to go. We're still sort of, I guess, testing this out. Yeah. So certainly if anybody has any comments on that, feel free to leave them on our Facebook or our blog spot. 
I think those would be, or the Twitter. Yeah, we also, I just posted our podcast email on our anchor page. It's chrononautspodcast at gmail.com if you prefer to send an email to. We're certainly receptive. It might be the case that people like either way and we might just do both <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah i mean it is a difficult question and yeah I, I i think that like shorter is probably better for most people but i could be wrong about this i could be wrong about this i mean i think that some of you are probably seasoned podcast listeners certain people in my circle are not so if i tell them hey we have this three-hour podcast on feminism they're probably not you know they're going to balk <laughs> right. a little bit but then again, some people seem to prefer the long format, and I, I definitely have followed a few podcasts that are like that, but most of them are an hour or less. Yeah. So I think it just depends on your audience. So that's what we're trying to figure out. Who is our audience and what does our audience want? So not only in terms of the time, but, you know, if you have any other thoughts, feel free to send them our way. And who knows, we may incorporate them into a future episode. Reading your comments is not out of the realm of possibility. So speak up and let your voice be heard. Yep, we certainly yeah. love to hear from you. Right. So with that bit of uh, house cleaning out of the way, what have you been watching or reading lately that's not associated with Chrononauts? So I haven't really been watching anything, really. But reading-wise, I've been reading various stories out of the Dark Descent anthology, just kind of slowly pecking away I at love that, that volume. Yeah, uh, so my copy of it is the full three volumes, which is about a thousand pages or so, and I'd say there's, uh, there has to be like 75 stories in there. Oh, yeah, easily. So for those, those who don't know, this is a massive horror fiction anthology that spans from sometime in the early 1800s to yeah. probably the 80s or something like that. I think. I think yeah, I don't think story. it goes anything more recent than the 80s. I think it was published around 88 or 89 or something like that. I yeah, don't that, recall the exact date. But it definitely goes pretty early. Like Fenu and Poe and all the other people from the early 19th century that you'd expect to be there are there. As well as quite a few people from in between. And I think the selection curation of the stories is really well done and it, it flows really well it doesn't get too samey no there is a nice variety of stuff in there yeah to write anything from uh yeah from la fenu and poe to philip k dick yep they're all in there and uh including a few authors that we've covered on chrono yeah so a pair of reputations we covered last time i read in that and we're doing a couple stories in our upcoming later invisibility episode that are from that as well so i've been slowly picking away at that anthology, I'm probably not going to finish it anytime soon, but mm. I'm enjoying reading that for actual reading and for audiobooks that I like to listen to in the car when I'm doing errands around town and stuff like that. I just finished up Vanity Fair uh, about a week or two ago. Oh, nice. No, that's not a first reading for you, right? No, it's, it's my second reading. So when I do audiobooks, I like to do books that I've read before. That makes sense to me. Yeah, so I, I'm, yeah. I don't have to concentrate on the plot so much, but I can just more kind of focus on the language and just kind of get a second view of the characters and, and the events. And a book like Vanity Fair, which is very long and has a pretty large cast of characters, definitely benefits from a second reading. It's, it's definitely one of my favorite books. And this last week after I finished that, I just started Withering Heights because I wanted to do something a little more gothic. And that's not a first reading either, right? Right. Yep. Cool. Yeah, that one that one I've read at least a couple of times. Uh, Vanity Fair, I'm, that was one of the books that I was supposed to read in school that I didn't read. So, yeah. <laughs> And I mean, this I was actually talking to Juan on YouTube, if you're listening. Hey, but I was actually talking to him a while ago about this and that I really didn't have anything against a lot of the material that we were supposed to read in school. But there was just so much of it and I'm just right. not a fast enough reader to really keep up. So what I ended up having to doing to do was use cliff notes and things mm, like that. And I'm yeah. not proud of it. But there was no way I could... There was an English novel course, and that included Vanity Fair. It included Henry Fielding. included... Yeah. What's his name? Sam, Samuel Richardson. Yeah, Clarissa. Cl Clarissa and I think Pamela as well, actually. Yeah, right, right. And it included some Dickens, and it included Middlemarch by Elliot. Yeah, that's a lot. 
<laughs> that's yeah, a, lot. a lot of good stuff but too much and the yeah. thing is while i was doing this i was taking five other courses so right it was just an impossible impossible thing and and the professor was well-meaning and and everybody was good but i just and there was no point in arguing with people because they kind of do all this curriculum assignment completely independently of everyone else so yeah you yeah. just have to take on the responsibility and unfortunately it was just not so vanity fair even though it sounded interesting it was one that I just didn't read. So that, that's on my list. And I was uh, telling a friend that today, it's on my list of longer works to read because... Absolutely, yeah. It's definitely a highlight of the 19th century for me in literature in general. And the narrator that did this particular audiobook, Wanda McCadden, she does a great job with it. You had mentioned Fielding. I think that the novel does take a lot of influence from Tom Jones oh, yeah. as far as the humor goes and the cutting nature of it. Structurally, it's like a Dickens novel where it's this huge cast of characters over the course of like 20 or 30 years, but it's a lot more grounded in reality than Dickens in that Dickens characters tend to be these like exaggerated, almost cartoony caricatures at times. Yeah, they're very caricaturish. Yeah, And there's clear heroes and villains, and Dickens almost always has a happy ending, whereas Thackeray's characters are more three-dimensional, and there's really no heroes. I mean, the subtitle of the novel is A Novel Without a Hero. Oh, and yeah. It, it's just really, really very good. Yeah, that's that's definitely on my list. of. I mean, when I, when I read by choice, I seem to gravitate more towards shorter things. Uh, yeah. I think it's just because... It just seems like so much of undertaking, and and, and it is quite was, long. Yeah. I was having a, a conversation with my friend about this today, and it's the same with TV shows. I, I'll often start a TV show and I just not finish it because it's yeah. just too many episodes, and I just it's not that it's not good necessarily. It just I get exhausted or something, and I just can't. Uh, yeah. To me, as a Dark know, Shadows fan, I can definitely relate there. <laughs> I've still never yeah. finished it. I got about a thousand episodes in, and by that point, it was just a chore. So stopped you can't continue yeah, yeah. I, I mean that's like an advantage of episodic television is that you don't have to watch every episode you right. just tune in whenever you feel like yeah. it and that is an old school tv thing like now they don't it's it's we it's kind less of all of picked up on the soap opera model a yeah bit. yeah and that has its good and bad points i mean the good the good side of it is you can construct these involved complex narratives but they're not very good for casual viewing. Right. And they do that deliberately because they're hoping that you'll get hooked into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, something that my dad, for example, who's already very cynical about television, would be extremely cynical about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I remember watching Babylon 5 in the early 90s and yeah. hearing like, his comments like that. It's like, oh, they really just want you to keep watching. <laughs> yeah. No. I've, yeah. But I mean, there was a, one of the pioneers of that in, I guess, science fiction genre TV, really. I thought a lot of the comparisons to Deep Space Nine of Babylon 5 fans being upset that a Deep Space Nine supposedly ripped it off for just them being salty and having sour grapes that Deep Space Nine was more popular. But after having watched Babylon 5 all the way through within the last, I don't know, five or six years, because before I'd only seen an episode here and there, there really is a lot of similarities between the two. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Yeah, I think Babylon 5 was written before, but Deep Space Nine beat it to production or something like that. It definitely so I think draws... The pilot, like the, the movie pilot or whatever came out first. Yeah. But I don't know that the, the TV series... I'm sure somebody that's a fan will correct us, but... Yeah. It was around the same time, certainly, and I did not actually stick with Babylon 5, whereas I did stick with DS9, so... Yeah, I mean, Babylon 5 is definitely more flawed on the surface, and you can definitely tell Deep Space Nine had the better luck with production. Babylon 5 was an early adopter of computer graphics, which, while cutting edge at the time, really does not age well at all. Right. They had some bad luck with the casting in that they had to change main characters a whole bunch of times for a wide variety of reasons, so they have to constantly write people on and off the show, as well as they thought that they were going to be done by the end of season four so they wrote an end to the show and then they got another season and they were kind oh, yeah. of like well what are we going to do now for the beginning of season five so that same thing happened to blake seven 
Yeah. That the fourth season of Blake 7 was like, a, oh, no, we have a fourth season. What are we going to do? Yeah, Blake 7 right. handled a lot better, though. I think that fourth season is really, really well done. Whereas Babylon 5, there's some really great parts to it. And I think overall it's worth watching. But it does feel more uneven in a lot of ways, both in terms of the production and the plotting and the acting. Um, but I think overall it's it's very enjoyable and very ahead of its time in that it was really one of the first shows to take on that arc-based storytelling in uh, science fiction you know, genre yeah. TV. I can, and it definitely did do that um, before Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Deep Space Nine was episodic in the beginning, and then oh, uh, yeah. it became more arc-driven later on. So, right. Right. I mean, I guess in that sense, they could also the fans could also claim that Babylon 5 was an influence, but I don't necessarily see it that way. I just think that's the way a lot of television was sort of starting to go. Sure. For me, for Babylon 5, I, I guess I... I kind of wish that I'd stuck with it sometimes, but I just had trouble with the characters and the writing. I just, I don't know. I just, it seemed very heavy handed to me. Like the, there's a lot of things that seemed like foreshadowing. Yeah. But they were like the kind of foreshadowing where it's, you could tell they had something in mind. So they wanted you to feel that they had something in mind for the future. And it just felt very uh, artificial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, but maybe one day I'll, I'll take another stab at it. Yeah, I mean, and, and what you're talking about, the behind-the-scenes stuff, is, is quite interesting, actually, because as somebody who's become more interested in that recently, one of the things that I was watching, kind of, I kind of didn't get all the way through, but I was watching, in the last several months, most of the James Bond films. Okay. And, I mean, some of them are really fun and fun to watch. Some of them are not so good, but the thing is... They all have amazing behind the scenes oh, stories. Oh, yes. Yeah, I bet. There's so much stuff. Yeah. And they went to all these locations that would have been considered exotic for the time sometimes. And mm -hmm. they went to a lot of really off the cusp, spontaneous things happened that they actually incorporated into the, the films where you actually you think, oh, this is a multi million dollar project. They must have really planned everything out so meticulously and done. Right. And then there was yeah. a, a certain <laughs> amount of that, but there was also yeah. a lot of ad living and certain things that you hear that the way they decided to do something is like so spur of the moment and so just oh let's just try this and they would do things like one of the guys uh, I can't remember, harry seltzman or something he would see like something in a newspaper about some guy who had tested out this new device like a special kind of hovercraft or gun or something and they would be like hey we should get that guy in the movie and or we should get him to to do his thing and they would and uh, other weird things like driving through, not New York, because that's, some of it was set in New York, but wherever they shot Live and Let Die, like oh. the non-New York scenes, and they were just driving by and they saw this guy with like a crocodile ranch. And they're like, hey, we should use that in the movie. Yeah. And they just, they just did. <laughs> it's just, it's so cool. And all the stunts and stuff, some of them were really dangerous. A couple of people got injured. One person died during the shooting of, I think it was, uh, it might have been For Your Eyes Only or something. Right. And just it's just a really interesting set of backstories. Now, I did not finish the series. I kind of skipped most of the 90s ones and went right to Casino Royale from 2006, I think it was. But yeah, I mean, the series had its ups and downs. Kind of a funny thing at uh, Christmas time when I was in the middle of, of doing this. Sorry, Mom, if you're listening, I'm going to make fun of you. But we, <laughs> I was hanging out at my mother's place and we were looking for a movie to watch and she has all a bunch of streaming services but it was uh, really difficult to find something we could agree on i wasn't being too too picky but i was just throwing out all kinds of suggestions and they were just not coming up and so i said well i've been watching the james james bond movies why don't we watch one of those we ended up watching from russia with love which is the second one which is one that i really like it's one of the ones that i i think is not necessarily most representative of the series but it's probably in terms of actual storyline and presentation it's probably one of the best ones yeah it's definitely one of my favorites yeah and it's also compared to most of the other ones it's fairly realistic i mean it's not you know not entirely so right there's still there's still some bond ridiculousness but it doesn't have the screwy gadgetry and the humor is sort of there but it's subtle it's, it's sort of played a lot more straight than some of the later ones even starting with goldfinger we were watching this movie and my mom was not into it it was it, to be fair it was quite late but she ended up falling asleep and at one point she said oh well what's that one with halle berry we should watch die another day hmm. and uh, i'm laughing because i remember that one being probably one of the worst of the series and like way way on the other end of the spectrum yeah from, right from watching with love like everything that that movie is 
Die Another Day is not. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I don't know. I also, let's see what else I've been watching. I started watching this series called Inside Number 9, and it's this British anthology series done by, uh, I should have looked up the actors' names. I can't remember that they also write uh, the series. It's, it's people who are involved with the League of Gentlemen. Okay. But not Mark Gatiss. I don't think he's involved with this one so much. But it's pretty cool. It's It's got a lot of different formats. There's a lot of horror references. There's a lot of comedy. There's some real slapstick stuff. There's some crazy stuff. I, I mean, I, I kind of started getting a little bit not bored with it because, I mean, it is an anthology and you never know what to expect. There's, you know, right. always different characters and stuff. But I think that I started to sort of feel, get the feeling for how they did the show and the endings, the way they, they always have a twist ending. And they always have this, like, improbable set of circumstances and, and, you know, resolving in this crazy, crazy twist ending. And I, it started to feel a little bit like, okay, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, a little contrived there, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. But the only episodes are only about 25 minutes long each. Yes, yeah, nice. yeah. There's only about seven or eight episodes per season. And I think there's... Yeah. I think, so it's really easy to watch. Yeah, UK TV is like that, where they do shorter seasons and not, like... I don't know, a 25 episode run or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it works quite well. Like it's a, a, a neat diversion. Now I, I like all the, the references to older movies and literature and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, the, the acting is good and some of the, the twists are quite fun, but I think maybe after four seasons, I just needed a break from it probably. Right. I'll, I'll yeah. Probably come back to it, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely good. I did get together with a few friends in the last while. We watched a couple movies. We watched The Devil's Reign, the 1975 film with William Shatner and Tom Skerritt and John Travolta's first role, which I believe is non-speaking. You yeah, haven't seen that one. Yeah, that was quite fun. It was kind of a devil cult sort of movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was, I mean, it's pretty, I don't know, It's it's kind of got a bit of a Western feel to it. And it's definitely not a great movie. It has a lot, a lot of things about it that are kind of goofy and a lot of kind of boring parts but it was actually cool at the same time and Anton LaVey was actually in the movie oh nice so <laughs> yeah it, it was pretty neat in that way like there was just a lot of cool things to note about it the director was Robert Fwest who worked on the British show The Avengers and he also was responsible for the Dr. Fives movies with Vincent Price. Yeah, those are cool. So, yeah, those are cool. Those are the, I haven't seen the second one actually but the, the first one is really cool. I have yeah. A, movie in that he's definitely a favorite this one i wouldn't say it's a favorite but uh i don't know it's okay i don't think <laughs> one of the people that i was watching it with enjoyed it very much but later on we watched uh this i am here now movie from oh this, yeah that one's <laughs> ridiculous yeah yeah she said that was probably the worst movie she'd ever seen so i felt kind of syndicated i don't know if i'd go that far but it was definitely very ridiculous, yeah. Yeah. My friend is, he was into this other Neil Breed movie. I think it was called, oh no, I can't remember what it was called. He's got a bunch. Yeah, apparently. And they're, apparently they all are this this weird, like, messianic thing they have going on. Uh, yeah, sort of like, right. Uh, a, a really cut rate Alejandro Jodorowsky or something like that. Yeah. Um, Vanity projects, I guess. For himself, he's a Vegas real estate guy or something that has oh, yeah. money to burn. Yeah, it's really, really dismal stuff. Interesting. Yeah, it wasn't very good. I mean, it was funny though in parts. Uh, yeah, some of the I acting, the way they deliver lines. Is, oh yeah, I, uh... I definitely noticed that. <laughs> I actually thought maybe they should just redub the whole thing with like different voice actors. Right. <laughs> maybe it would be better. <laughs> But I guess, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of one of those things like Tommy Wiseau in the room and stuff. Exactly, where it's like yeah. People kind of watch it just to have a laugh. Yeah. And yeah, it was okay to drink and have fun with. So, yeah. I haven't really been watching that much else either. I did watch the classic 80s gory exploitation film Street Trash. Uh, not that oh, long yeah. Ago. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that one in a theater one time. That was fun. Oh, night. really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, that would be something. <laughs> Yeah, uh, theater. I haven't actually been inside a movie theater in a really long time. Yeah, I, I don't think, either. I don't think the last time I've been in one was like two years ago, maybe. Yeah, I don't remember. I think probably the last time I was in a theater was the end of 2016 when I went to see Star Wars World One. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. okay. Yeah, it was okay. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't think about it too much afterwards. In fact, I, I remember 
watching Empire Strikes Back the next day and think, yeah, this movie's still good, but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think Rogue One could have used some cutting, but yeah. You know. I, I thought it was cool that they brought back Grand Moff Tarkin, though. Yeah, I actually didn't like the CGI Peter Cushing. No, and he um, didn't sound like him. Like no, him. not at all. Yeah. <laughs> you would think that that would be the part that that he would. I mean, I'm sure the actor did his best, but like that would be the part that they would try really hard to get right. Right. Yeah. I but I mean, I've seen like many, many Peter Cushing movies by now, and that guy did not sound like him. No, and yeah, it was a big. So, yeah, it didn't work at all for me. That and the. The CGI Carrie Fisher um, that they oh. did at the end also. I, I don't know. I wasn't into that. Yeah. Was she? Yeah. I, I, that was before she died, though, right? I, yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. I haven't really been keeping up with any of the, the, the Star Wars saga. Like, that was just sort of a random thing. I was kind of hanging out with somebody, and I was like, oh, let's go see Rogue One. And so, I mean, I haven't watched any of the the newer, like, the ones that are supposed to be the main storyline. Right, yeah. I saw episode 7, and I thought it was okay, and I started episode 8, and really wasn't feeling it. I was like, I'll come back to this later, and I never did. And <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, that's fine story for of my me. Life. Yeah. yeah. But the Dune film that was supposed to come out last year, I think they've set a firm release date this yeah. year. So that'll be a cool theater experience if everything is back I think they were hoping to do it when yeah, the theaters reopened. Right. Because my friend was actually very concerned because the initial plan was to release on uh, HBO Max, I think. Right. And that's not available in Canada. Oh, uh, okay. It may not be available in many countries, period. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure. But he said that's just going to lead to everybody pirating the movie. Right, and exactly. It's going to be a massive failure. Yeah. And he was very upset about that. <laughs> so yeah. I guess maybe the, the studio finally got wise and kind of realized the same thing. Yeah. They don't want to lose money on this project, right? No, so, they definitely sunk a ton into it already. And I think yeah. the plan is to do at least another one to finish up the first novel because they're breaking it into two films. And okay. then I don't know what their long-term plans are, if they're going to try to cover books two through three or four. Yeah. That's four is borderline different. unfilmable. And I agree, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and two is not very well liked. Uh, although I, I did think it was an important addendum to like an important finishing up of a story from the first book. Yeah. like I think that you kind of needed Dear Messiah to really finish off that story. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm 100 percent happy with the way it went. I think it had some really cool elements in it. Like it definitely wasn't as good as the first one, and it had some kind of silly stuff in there. But yeah. I think overall, it was a cool take on the story and the tropes. Yeah, and another reason I think that it is needed is because a lot of people didn't really understand where the first book was going. Like they just saw, oh, you right, know, this guy. This guy journeyed into the desert and he helped these people and rose to be Messiah. And it's another quest type story. I don't know. I can't remember. There's a, a nice German word to describe what kind of story it is, but I can't think of it right now. Bildungsroman, you mean? Possibly, yeah. And it's not really. like it, there's, there's a lot of layers to Paul's story that are not necessarily so, so glorious. Right. And I think that people sort of miss that. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly foreshadowing in the first book. Yeah. But once you have read, I guess, where it goes in books two and three primarily, and you go back to the first one, you do see a lot of those elements quite present throughout the entire book, which didn't really surface to me on first reading. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that's uh, something I want to reread uh, soon, for sure. But one thing I am rereading because I'm doing this because I think it might be covered on a, a YouTube channel soon, possibly, is... This book that I read probably back in 2007 or 8 it's called The Dark Fantastic by Stanley Ellen. Hmm. And Stanley Ellen was a crime writer. He got a start in the 1940s, and I think this was either his last or his second last book, which was written in the early 80s. And it's interesting because it's a crime story told in part by a detective, like a private investigator type. But it's also a story about uh, race relations in the United States. And... Half the book is actually the recording that this guy is making, and he's this old ex-professor guy who owns an apartment building in New York City. And this apartment building is mostly full of African Americans, and this man is on the point of death. He's got a terminal cancer, and he has decided that he is going to go out by destroying this building, blowing it up, hmm. and killing everybody inside it. 
So it's kind of this, you know, it's half like this detective story where this kind of cool, but slightly uh, like getting on towards middle age private investigator is trying to solve this, like this art thievery thing that's going on. And he ends up meeting this younger black woman and they end up developing a bit of a romance and her family lives in this building. So the stories kind of come together. Right. And it's pretty good. It's funny because it's one of those things at the time that I read it, I thought, yeah, it's good. I didn't know that it would necessarily stick with me, but it did. Like, I never really forgot about it. The narrative of this professor landlord is is really darkly compelling because he's so, like, absolutely, absolutely racist and, and yeah, un- right. irredeemable. But he never, you know, he doesn't descend to a lot of things that normally when people are like, okay, I'm writing this racist caricature now they use the n-word a lot and they get mm. all like self-righteous and stuff and he, he gets a bit self-righteous but he always keeps cool and he always uses polite language and stuff and he has some really dark thoughts and it's one of those things it's kind of like reading lolita or something and like getting right. inside the head of humbert humbert and being like oh this character's nasty but like he's pretty well spoken and i kind of want to see where he's going so as well as that, I also found a collection of his short stories, which were mostly published under the Ellery Queen byline. And so there's this huge compilation called Speciality of the House, which starts out in the 40s and goes on to like the late 70s or something. And it's got, I think, most of his short fiction in it. And they're really good, too. They're like, they're crime stories, but they also have a weird element to them sometimes. They, they almost remind me of like Roald Dahl sometimes, like his stories mm. for adults. The story Speciality of the House was actually dramatized on the vincent price price of fear show okay so that was pretty cool like that was it was kind of neat to discover that because i didn't really know anything about stanley ellen until i read the dark fantastic and then i was looking into this radio show and i saw that they did this stanley ellen story and i'm like oh cool that guy did a bunch of stuff back then i should have known that and so i started digging into him a little more and yeah it's it, it's good stuff definitely recommended I've also been reading Lanark by Alistair Gray, which is this really long, strange Scottish novel, which is like half really bizarre science fiction and half this sort of bleak coming of age story of this young man in 1950s Glasgow. Hmm. Uh, It's very odd and it's very good, but it's quite long and I, I haven't really devoted that much time to reading it. I was really into the weird serialistic sci fi part, but then. I got into the the Glasgow stuff and it was it was also like just as well written but it was it's pretty depressing actually because this guy is trying to be an artist and pretty much failing at every turn yeah right so I don't know I, I like the book though it's very well written apparently Alistair Gray is quite well known as a, a, a both a novelist but also a kind of a social philosopher I believe on the conservative side of the spectrum but yeah, it's 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 good it's definitely an interesting book and I am looking forward to finishing it at some point who knows when <laughs> of course we've also been reading a lot for chrononauts and yes we uh, definitely have right now we're we're getting ready to deliver our aviation episodes so i believe we're both into hg wells war in the air we'll reserve discussion of that till next time yep so we decided to compile top 10 lists of all the stuff that we've done so far and i just want to preamble this by saying that the only stipulations that i really made was that these could be either novels or short stories and we're not directly comparing them to one another and of course these are our personal takes so you know we're not necessarily going by literary merit alone and you may disagree with some of these takes and that's totally fine and cool and of course again feel free to comment on that if you do the other thing of course is that you can't really compare novels to short stories i mean one has a lot less content than the other But I deliberately wanted to include them both in the same purview, just because I didn't want to make a separate category for short stories. I just thought that would be too much and also too little because, I mean, it kind of says, oh, these are lesser than the novels, so they have to be included in their own their own category. So this is just essentially how we felt after reading each individual piece. So if you want, you can kick it off with your number 10. Sure. Yeah, I guess before I get into the number 10, I was thinking that I wasn't going to include the stuff that was like really, really tangential, even though I like some of that. So that includes, for me, the Balzac and The Last Man. I think both 
the Balzac novels and that Shelley are really, really good. And I like them a lot. But their connection to science fiction and I guess the scope of this is very minimal. And I think The Last Man in particular, its science fictionness and importance really gets overstated. Yeah. So I just with those caveats in mind, my top ten picks, I deliberately wanted to pick stuff that was more in scope of science fiction and would potentially appeal to people that want a science fiction story. So I guess with that said, uh, my number 10 is When the Green Star Waned, which we covered last time. Oh, nice. I thought this was an awesome story with Chad. So much cool stuff going for it, packed into a very short amount of time. And even though I felt the writing and pro style was clunky at times, there's a lot of really cool imagery here that makes up for it. Yeah, that's definitely true. And now I feel I feel like I should have included that, but that's that's the way these things are. I didn't want us to influence yeah, each other in right. how we did this. And I mean what you were saying about the the Balzac and Shelley is probably true, but I did think of including Gambara from Balzac on here and in the end I didn't. So yeah. and it was one of those things like should I include it or should I not? And it hurt to leave a couple yeah. of these off. <laughs> right. But I did and I think I decided on a top ten. So my number ten is Star Sci. Okay. by De Fontenay. This was a really interesting book. It was certainly way, way out there for something written yeah. in uh, 1830, whatever it was. It's the 50s, but yeah, still very, okay. very early. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very early, and, and there's just like such amazingly outre concepts and everything from the, the disease that affected the Starians to the journeys to the different planets to the, the sort of asteroid ballet by the end of the book it was just and the poetry the the Cestarian poetry i did not think the translation was super engaging if i was confident enough in french i would have probably rather read it in french just yeah. because it seemed like it was lacking a little bit of a little bit of flair i guess in the translation yeah. but nevertheless despite all that it was a very interesting journey for sure and so that's my number 10 cool all right my number nine is Edgar Allan Poe's The Facts in the Case of Monsieur Valdemar. Nice. Yeah, this was, again, really, really short, but it packs a lot in there. And the final scene was just such an awesome, like, gross-out science fiction horror moment that it, it really made it for me. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And without getting too into it, that's on my list as well, but that's coming up. Number nine for me is The Sandman by E.T.A. Hoffman. Okay. This was... A really fascinating story. It was a horror story. It definitely had some real science fiction elements to it. I found the expression of the uncanny valley phenomenon to be really fascinating yeah. because I had thought that that was like nothing like that came around until like a hundred over a hundred years later. Right. So I was so surprised to see it expressed in that way. I was not surprised to see something like, oh, it's a, an automaton. Isn't that freaky? But there was yeah. so much more to it than that. <laughs> yeah. And it was so cool. And there was a lot going on. A lot tied into childhood fears and aberrant psychology. There was alchemy. There was illusion. There were automata. There were dreams. It was really an interestingly layered and complex piece of work, which is the kind of thing that I think would stand multiple readings where you kind of know where it's going and you know what exactly. to expect. Yeah. And of course, it also had a duel. So there's just <laughs> so much to recommend this story. And it was really cool. Not at all what I was expecting, I think. And I just, I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, likewise. And it really makes me wonder how much, if at all, it influenced Mary Shelley for Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Although it did have a very different feel. Like sure. It, it seemed to have a lot of that deep psychological underpinning that I, yeah. can, I can sort of see why Sigmund Freud actually wrote an entire essay sort of based upon right. this story and even yeah. called it the uncanny. So it's, yeah, that's interesting work for sure. No, it's definitely a great one. My number eight is Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth. Mm. I was surprised, I don't know why, but at how much I really like this one. It's at its core a simple adventure story, but even the building up to the expedition, he fills it with so many interesting details, and it just kept my attention going and grabbed it initially, and it didn't really let up at all. And when they finally got to the center of the Earth, it felt 
really exciting. And even though the title lets you know where they're going, it felt novel and it felt new and it felt, I don't know, he just did such a good job with the buildup and the payoff that I just really enjoyed every step of the way on the journey. And it didn't really do too much more than adventure, but it does it really, really well. Yes. Yes. I can definitely, definitely say that as well. And I probably will say that shortly, but before I get to that, <laughs> my number eight is Rappuccini's Daughter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Yeah, this one was really good. Yeah, this was a really good story. Not at all. It's funny because I believe uh, I commented on this on the episode way back in episode four. Nathaniel Hawthorne is not really part of the school curriculum here. I think that a lot of Americans probably at least read the Scarlet Letter. Yep, Scarlet Letter is a standard one. Yeah, but I don't remember anybody in any of my schools reading that one or anything else by him. But it was probably through uh, horror collections like The Dark Descent that I became introduced to Young Goodman Brown, mm -hmm. which is a really good story. Yeah. This one, it was just really interesting. It was sad. It was poignant. It was strange. It definitely had uh, an element of science fiction to it. So I think it was very fitting to do for the podcast. It had this sort of inkling of bio, almost like bioterror to it. Yeah. Which was, again, pretty ahead of its time. But instead of being this like menacing sort of evil thing, it was like, it was almost like the person who was poisonous to the human race was, yeah. was not a bad natured person at all. Right. Corruption of the body, not the soul. Right. And, and so you felt really sorry for... For both of them, really, but especially for her. And the fact that she was basically used as a, not really an experiment, but I mean, in a way it was, but her father thought he was doing a good thing, as many themes of out-of-control scientific exploration, the person, in the, the scientist involved always feels that they're doing good, and that they're helping out the world. But in this case, he was just like, I'm protecting her from, from all this evil, almost, right? And it was just like, it was really kind of twisted when you thought about it, and it was just a really poignant, powerful story, and one that I liked a lot, and one that made me want to read more Hawthorne. Yeah, he has a fair amount that's more in the gothic vein, and I've yeah. seen some of his stuff from around this time that we didn't read also cited as early examples of science fiction. So. Right. Yeah, the in the Scientific Romances book we took some stuff from last time is the story The Artist of the Beautiful. Yeah, I haven't read that one. Yeah, it sounds interesting. I'd like to read it. The movie with uh, some of these stories was also quite yeah. fun, I thought. <laughs> so, yeah, I like yeah. that one. Yeah. So what's your number seven? My number seven is The Coming Race by Bulwer Lytton. I thought the atmosphere in this was just absolutely incredible. Even though the plot could have used some improvements in places and mm. maybe the pacing wasn't the greatest. I just loved the atmosphere and the feeling that came across here. This sense of foreboding dread that permeates the entire course of the novel, really. It just really worked very, very well for me. Yeah, that is one that I did agonize also over whether to include, and it did yeah. not actually make my list, and I do feel that hurts a little bit because <laughs> I enjoyed it as well. But really few instances here of doing this of things that I didn't enjoy at all. Right. And so I always try to find the good aspects of something, even if I didn't think it was amazing. And, and there was certainly a lot of good, good in the coming race. There was a lot of atmosphere, like you said, there was some interesting foreboding, and I actually kind of strangely enjoyed how it sort of turned into this weird, like, romance drama towards yeah. the end. Yeah. Like, it, it, it wasn't really expected, and it kind of... I do feel like with some of these early works that we've been doing, one thing that's lacking a little bit is sometimes there just doesn't seem to be a lot of conflict or drama. Like, it just seems like the ideas take precedence over... Sure. ...interactions, and... and I don't always mind that, but sometimes I do want I do want a little more of that because my interest tends to pick up when the characters are were like they have some obstacle or they have some even like especially obstacle within themselves yeah. within their interactions that they have to deal with. Well, that's and, exciting. Yeah, and it took a while for coming race to get there, but it eventually got there. So I definitely think like the book was pretty awesome in the beginning, and then it sort of fell off towards the middle where it's just kind of describing the society for, like, pages and pages. Yeah. But then towards the end, it kind of picked up again. And yeah. then the ending was actually really, again, quite sad. 
Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. When he left the, the, the underground world and Z was kind of like talking to him about how they probably wouldn't meet again, but maybe in some weird afterlife or whatever, they would connect somehow. And then, of course, when he got back to the upper world, he was like, well, one day the Vrilia will come out and <laughs> then we better all beware, right? <laughs> right. It's going to be the death of all of us. Yeah. And they're just going to like, their kids are going to wipe us out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a good book. And I'm sorry it didn't make my list. It could No, no, it's way. fine. I mean, I'm uh, no judgment here. Number seven, though, is Journey to the Center of the Earth. I uh, read a little bit of Vern before this podcast, and I kind of enjoyed some of it. The problem I've always had with Vern is kind of what I said earlier. It's just there's often lot, not a lot of drama between the characters. Right. And I found that in the Moon Book, for sure. But in this one, even though there wasn't much of that, I don't know. This story engaged me a little more. I thought the interactions between nephew and uncle were quite fun. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in the beginning, you know, it was like the uncle is all gung-ho about doing this stuff and the nephew's trying to come up with all these bullshit reasons as to why they can't. I, I don't know. It's interesting reading about like the introductory material and seeing that he actually had written a little more about the romance between himself and the female character that is not really in the story. <laughs> yeah, these translations sometimes get hacked up a lot. Well, I think that the Butcher ones are good, but I think they it was are. actually his publisher, Hetzel, who made him change some things. Oh, you mean like. from the initial manuscript? Yeah. 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 But I, I remember we were looking at one of the other translations where we found an audiobook or something and oh they, yeah like, yeah they totally and they changed, changed the, the names name. of the characters yeah. yeah it was it was ridiculous yeah. yeah it was obviously i mean not to say that like later translations are always better but i do feel sometimes like a lot of the earlier ones are more concerned with like making it appealing to the public of right. whatever language they're translated into rather than being true to the source material yep Absolutely. And it's like, oh, you know, these Englishmen are not going to like these German names and they're not going to like the, this and that. And, and we got to change all that. Right. And they also sometimes leave out entire sentences and paragraphs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, but I think with the butcher translations of Vern, we seem to be in safe hands. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and uh, we're going to come back to Vern certainly in the future. And I think we're going to be using those as the guide because he also has extensive commentary on the novels and introductions, as well as written the biography. And I think he's probably the definitive source on Burn, at least for modern scholarship. It certainly sounds that way. I also watched the movie Journey to the Center of the Earth, the 50s one. I watched the, the newer one too, but I didn't like it at all. Yeah. I commented on that. Right. The one from the 50s I had a lot of fun with. It was very different from the book. But once I kind of realized that, I just sort of accepted it. When yeah, okay, they added some of the things in that I thought, are missing from Vern, so I'm not going to really complain as long as they're decently handled. And they were. It was a really fun movie. It had a great music score. It had a great performance from James Mason, and it had just some really awesome elements that took the story in interesting, kind of fun, odd directions. Mm -hmm. So that was like probably of all the movie experiences since starting the podcast related to Chrononauts, that was probably my favorite. I like the Hawthorne one a lot. I have yep, to say. that was good too. Because uh, I mean, Vincent Price is hard to dislike in anything, even though he plays <laughs> Vincent Price in like every movie. Yeah, every yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I like that one too, but I guess it was maybe maybe because I wasn't expecting to like the Journey movie as much. Yeah, because in a book that I'm about to mention later on, the person had commented that it was like cheesy and had a lot of songs in it and stuff, and I was like. Oh, great. I'm not looking forward to this, but I'll watch it anyway. <laughs> yeah. But, like, the musical interludes were confined to the very beginning of the movie, performed by Pat Boone. Right. And I didn't think the movie was cheesy at all, actually. I, I kind of, like, they they kind of left out the things that might have been cheesy looking. Like, they, they didn't include the, the dinosaurian things. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a shame, but at the same time, like I said in the podcast... This was not a B movie. Like this wasn't a Ray Harryhausen production or anything like that. So they they just made the story different. They made it this sort of like fight between the old decayed world of Europe and the new world almost. Like it was kind of how it came across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It was a lot of fun. That's my number seven pick. Cool. Yeah, number six for me: the clock that went backboard oh. by Edward Page Mitchell. This one also very, very short, but a lot of it really comes together here. So there's that whole gothic introduction of the old 
farmhouse or whatever decaying house it is and the trees in autumn and the antique clock and then it goes to this chaotic battle scene in the Netherlands centuries prior and you get a nice twist at the end and it really reminds me of like the best of a Twilight Zone episode or the best of those kind of anthologies where it's very short and it explores not necessarily a simple concept but one that sticks with you and I think Mitchell has a really good pro style and he has a lot of witty lines in there as well mm -hmm. as being very good at atmospheric description as well yeah that's definitely very well said absolutely my number six is uh, facts in the case of monsieur valdemar yeah a great one yep. yeah this was just an amazingly good horror story it's very short and it's just what it needs to be i i do like edgar Allan poe a lot but i i do time i i caution people when i talk about him that he does tend to go on a bit sometimes yeah like he really gets into the weeds and thrashes around for like paragraphs and paragraphs and it can get a little bit like exhausting almost but this story is not like that at all uh, it's very to the point it's sort of presented in this faux scientific style as though it was a real documentary evidence of, of this phenomenon that he's trying to describe but he can't resist throwing in a few of those poisms like describing in minute detail how somebody's lungs are decayed and stuff like that right and he'll like he'll first he'll describe one and he's like yeah you think that's bad look at the other one <laughs> that one's even worse yeah <laughs> and yeah like you said that last moment is so horrendous just like oh man it's it's uh, everything from the point where he's supposed to be dead and and like you hear him screaming and and he's like uttering these inarticulate sounds and stuff like that and it's just yeah and then it, finally at the end sort of just coalescing and vaporizing into this like putrescence yeah yeah and then just ending the story like that it's just so good yeah i mean and poe's best horror stuff is when he keeps it to like four or five pages right and i think his most well-known stories like the black cat cask of amontadillo yeah those are all short yeah pit in the pendulum is very exactly short. yeah mask of the red death you yeah, know, you got like Fall of the House of Usher. That one's a bit longer, mm -hmm. but that's a really good one as well, of course. But we're going to be covering his longest fictional work that was published, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. Yes, we are going to be covering that one, and it'll be interesting to see how he does in a much longer format. It is a bit of a scatterbrained narrative, to be yeah, sure. Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah, it's one of the ones that I've read before, and it'll probably be one of the few that I've read before i guess going forward but i think pretty much everything is going to be new to me from this point on but yeah it's, it's a good one it's interesting if not a little flawed yeah yeah so i'm looking forward to getting to that and i don't know if we're going to do more poe in the future probably not but i think we did three stories in the mesmerism episode including valdemar and they all fit together rather well yeah a mesmeric revelation was probably the weakest of the three and i enjoyed ragged mountains a lot and this one so this one uh, valdemar it's it does what it needs to do and gets out which is yeah. what a good short story needs to do and i definitely agree it was the strongest out of the three yeah yeah definitely so that's my number uh, six all right number five for me the sandman oh yeah i really love this one the horror elements were awesome i mean playing on the folkloric aspects of it but turning it into this really sinister character who is just totally unpleasant and nasty and then the science fiction elements that come through later with the constructed android, I just really wasn't expecting it to go in that direction. And I was surprised at just how far ahead of its time it was. And that part of it also functioned really well as far as a horror piece. So I was definitely very pleasantly surprised at how that one all came together. Yeah, I, I think I already said pretty much all I needed to say on that one. And I'm glad that we both agreed. It was, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just that an awesome piece of work. I don't know that Hoffman has other things to deliver that are of that magnitude, but I guess I guess we probably not for this podcast. No. Um, it might be more fantasy gothic stuff mm -hmm. that I know he's written more of. Probably not science fiction, but I, for for gothic stuff, I think there might be something. There. Yeah, uh, you're probably right. I'll probably read some on my own time eventually. We also did the Automata. Yeah, it was for... okay. Yeah, it was okay. It wasn't as good as as these. Yeah, my number five, though, is First Man in the Moon by H.G. Wells. That, to me, was 
a really good book. Yeah. I didn't for some reason, want to include two works from the same author. I don't know. Yeah, it's not really that important. But right. So the time machine didn't actually make my list. But again, it could have on another day. It just didn't today. But the first man in the moon, I really enjoyed the build up. I enjoyed the way Wells writes about his characters. I think they're a lot of fun, but they're also yeah. kind of flawed, right? And they're like the way real people are. And I enjoyed the interaction between Bedford and Kabor and like even though they were not really friends by the end, which I no. was sort of expecting, you know, I yeah. was expecting this was going to be a buddy story, right? Right, yeah. And they're not really buddies at all, which was an interesting way to take the story, I yeah. thought. Because, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, they're tripping on moon mushrooms together and right. they're doing all this cool stuff. Like, they're going to be real close by the end of this. But it went the opposite way. And I thought that was kind of interesting. And the way the the Selenites and their biology and society is described was quite well thought out. Yeah, and I like that it, a lot. Yeah, and it was interestingly done. And when Benford got away, the story wasn't over yet. Right. Because there was still more to come. And I, I thought that the way he handled it was really good. The way Cavour tried to communicate his messages to the Earth made sense and was sort of tied in with some of the, the radio stuff that was going on. Sure, around absolutely. Then. Yeah. And of course, the very end is chilling. Yeah. Wells can occasionally go quite hard on the, the horror a little bit. It's not the main element of, I think, any of his stuff. No. But it's there more often than not. Yeah. Certainly present in, I think, all of the works we've read so far, including The War in the Air. I don't know how far into it you are. I'm about halfway through with that one. But, oh, there's definitely some horrific stuff going on in that, for sure. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't quite made it that far yet, but I'm enjoying it so far, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I would say or we are going to read it in the future. The Invisible Man and Island of Dr. Moreau yep. both lean quite hard on that side of things as well. So this was really good. This is a, a fast-paced, enjoyable... I mean, it had elements of a romp to it, but it also had a lot of thoughtfulness to it. Absolutely. So yeah. it had a lot of different moods from like action to contemplation. So I enjoyed a lot, and that's my number five. Yeah, that one didn't make my list, but I think it was probably the best out of the ones we've finished so far. I, I guess I will see how The War on the Air fares, but he's cool. a really, really good writer, and I've definitely really liked everything we've read by him so far, and we're certainly going to come back to him quite a few times. Yeah, me too. And aside from the ones mentioned already, I would like to sneak in a few of his short stories at some point, so yep. probably do that too. Absolutely. So, number four for me, Star Psy. Cool. Yeah, I just absolutely love the atmosphere on this. I love the stylistic choices, even though some of the stuff came off a little clunky at times. It had a real poetic touch and a flair for, I guess, literal dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, this was so far out there, even not considering the fact that it was written in the 1850s. It had so much incredible stuff. And while there were definitely some very apparent flaws to it, I think it's easy to overlook and really get lost in this, like, multi-thousand-year saga of uh, a solar system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Starians and their civilization. Yeah. Yeah. I love the Starian poetry. That was yeah. so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the little excerpts of plays and things like yeah. that. It's, it's really so cool. an interesting way of looking at the society. Yeah, and I don't think we've encountered anything that's been as bold with the stylistic choices so far, mm -hmm. even though we've covered some, not necessarily experimental stuff, but certainly some unconventional stuff that really goes far out there with playing around with style. Yeah, yeah, and I think the way that he introduced it as like this, almost like a child's work desk that fell out yeah. of the sky. Yeah. And it's a good way of saying, oh, here's like a representative look at a society, right? Because mm -hmm. that's exactly what you would find in such an artifact, pretty much. Yep. So yeah, that's really, it's really cool. I, I agree. My number four is The Clock That Went Backwards by Mitchell, uh, Edward cool. Page Mitchell. Yeah. I agree with everything you said about the story. I think there were a lot of interesting ambiguities and questions that story left me with and in my younger years i would have been so frustrated by this because i would have been like but they didn't tell us anything you know <laughs> but now i like it because it means you think about a story a lot after you've read it and right tell me less with more words please yes <laughs> <laughs> the uh the the twist if you can call it that at the end was so 
the way it was handled was just so strange for something of its vintage because yeah. I don't know that anybody had ever written some kind of a, a thing like that before. And so given that circumstances, I would have expected Mitchell to like have some kind of professorial type sort of sit down with the reader and explain to him exactly what happened to Harry and why he wasn't around anymore. Right, we didn't especially get any because of that. this was initially published in The Sun, I think, right? Which was yes. kind of like a, not necessarily tabloidy paper, but certainly a huge subscription base and not exactly known for being this highbrow literary journal or anything like that. Right, yeah. And I mean, I just like, nowadays, I think we take time travel stories so much for granted. And we take for granted the idea that if somebody goes into the past, they might change something or they might they might not yeah. come back because they might not be able to because of the changes that were made or something like that we take that so for granted that now we would say oh well i guess i don't really need an explanation for that although some people would still definitely want one sure but for a story written back then yeah it's like to not explain it but to sort of leave it there for you to think about like i can't help but wonder how many contemporary readers of that time were just like scratching their heads going, what yeah. is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this was remarkable. Like I actually, I actually am a little bit trepidatious about reading more Mitchell because I'm not sure that he can quite get to that point of quality again. We'll see. I mean, a lot of his other stuff is very well regarded. And the only yeah. other one we've done so far is this kind of brief little interview piece where he's yeah. kind of poking fun at sims but he's got I a lot actually of actually read the talking pump and i quite enjoyed it so i mean maybe you're right yeah i certainly don't get the feeling that he's that well regarded though i mean i i feel like maybe by the 70s there was sort of a resurgence of, of interest in him but like yeah even before then like who even knew his name well i think that's it he was just kind of fished out of obscurity by uh, was it sam moskowitz or uh, yeah, i believe it was moskowitz yeah so, yeah yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. It was just a collection of newspaper publications that were, I think, were mostly anonymous. And yeah, just one of those cases where it just fell through the cracks for decades and decades until he got republished in some recognition in the modern era. Right. And like the within the earth thing was like, it was fine, but it was kind of more like what you would expect from an anonymous newspaper publication. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Like it. it it felt like a humorous interview piece, like a satirical interview, and, and nothing more, really. So it right. was nowhere on the scale of, of this story. And I'm just like, how how did this come about? Where did this come from? Like, you yeah. know, just, just to, to make up a story like this. And I don't, I should have written down the publication dates again, because I still feel like Star Psy was earlier. We're probably going to have to look, look it up when we. Yeah, I think it was, <laughs> this was the 1870s, I want to say. Yeah, no, I meant. I meant earlier than like 1850 or whatever, but I, I, yeah, like sometimes it's hard to make sure you say the right uh, dates and things like that, but uh, we <laughs> right. do our best with these. Uh, we normally do pretty good, but yeah, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, 1870 sounds about right for... 1881 for this one. 1881. Yeah. Okay, cool. Still predating most other time travel stories. Yeah. By a long way. Certainly Wells. Mm -hmm. And then Akronopata. Yeah. So that's my number four pick. All right. Number three, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's uh -huh. a classic for a reason. Yep. I read this before the podcast, and I loved it when I first read it about, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, and I loved it now. It's a really, really good gothic story. It has a lot of elements to it that, for some reason, haven't been picked up in modern adaptations, like the fact that there is an intelligent creature that isn't this dumb monster but smoke good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he's really <laughs> wronged by humanity in every path of his life and that's why he's gone on this murderous rampage and it comments on more so human nature than any of the films really have and even though the brana one in the 90s they really tried to capture the original i think there were a lot of problems with that production that i think the definitive films are ones that don't really stick too much to the original story but kind of just do their own thing yeah. with the character i mean i think bride of frankenstein is is pretty great oh yeah like probably yeah. even better than the original frankenstein yeah i'd original, agree with that not original the um, the first universal 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I like the hammer ones a lot. Oh, the hammers are great, yeah. But they're very different too, right? Like yeah, absolutely. It's nothing at all like... Yeah. They're, yeah. I haven't seen the 90, 90s one that you're talking about. It's so. okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, probably De, De Niro not does a good job with the creature, but Brana really overacts. I mean, it's fine for <laughs> Shakespeare, but I don't know. It, it just doesn't work here. The, the pacing is off. There's some weird directorial choices. They could have made a better one. And honestly, I'm not sure why they haven't knocked out like a Frankenstein miniseries for Netflix or HBO or whatever in the modern era. It seems like it's yeah. one of those stories that's been around for... 200 years and popular the entire time it, it exactly seemed, yeah I, I don't know uh, but I, I don't know what goes in the head of some of these i know I, <laughs> so i mean i'm just gonna say it now my number three is also frankenstein all right and, well there we go and, <laughs> yeah so we'll talk about it a little more i so there's, there is a lot of other stuff missing from all the adaptations as well like the whole thing about the, the murderous stalking of everybody that victor cares about right and the trial of um what's her name justine justine yeah and, like, that's some really dramatic stuff. Absolutely, It's yeah. not there. And, like, all throughout the book, it's like she makes you dislike Victor more and more. Like, yeah. Because he's just so spineless, right? And it's just like he could he could do something to save at least Justine. And he, like, he feels really bad, but he doesn't do anything. <laughs> right. And, right. And this whole, like, awesome horror element, too, that reminds me of, I I, I don't know, reminds me of some, like, cool horror movies where like the people show up to to see this crazy young man who's doing all these experiments and he's got this like thing hidden in the basement that he really doesn't want them to see so he's right. pretending to be normal yeah. but everything's not normal at all and yeah it's just there's so much cool stuff and and to me what makes this a science fiction story even more than the famous monster creation which has not really gone into that much in oh no book. it's not gone into it all yeah right well, what makes this more science fiction to me is the ethics. Yeah, right. This whole question, which is still with us 200 years later, creating life and what that means and what responsibility that gives us. Right. If the life we create is actually, if we can consider it superior to us in some aspects, what does that mean for our future? What does that mean for the future of that life and what what responsibility are we putting on its shoulders? And mm -hmm. right now we're not looking, we're not looking so much at biology, maybe more so towards artificial intelligence and what that will mean. Because I mean, it's already possible for machines to like break the Turing test. Sure. So where are we going with this? Like, what are we going to do? We've covered a few stories dealing with the concept already besides Frankenstein. And I think we'll be getting more into it as the podcast goes on. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how people handle it because for the longest time, the basic reaction to any attempt to quote, play God quote, was this like visceral antagonism, right? It's this visceral, like, Oh, we shouldn't do that. Yeah. Like, of course it's going to be evil. And of course, like it's going to turn on its creator and yeah, everybody's going to be damned. And it's just so horrible. Right. And you can sort of see how people would see it that way, but, I think that's kind of missing the more important questions, right? It's like, it's a more matter of this is going to happen. Like, it's not going to be stopped just because one person is stopped from making the discovery at this point. Like, there will sure. be, there will be evolution that we will help to forward. So we have to tackle the more ethical questions, not so much whether something should be destroyed or not, but like, how can we take responsibility? And of course, Victor doesn't take any at all. No, he doesn't. <laughs> he just leaves. <laughs> and yeah. then there's there's a whole argument to be made too for the fact that this is a a man who wants, I guess, the accomplishment of being able to create something without the responsibility that's usually foisted on women. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Shelley was thinking along those lines, but I suspect she probably was. She'd already given birth to two children by that point, and one of them had died. Yeah, right. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is, this is her wrestling with some really important questions, for sure. So that's my number three pick as well. And I have a feeling that our number two and number one picks might also be not the same, maybe, but maybe switched around or reversed. It's very, very possible. <laughs> it's certainly very possible. Yeah, yeah. All right, so number two for me is A Voyage to Arcturus. This was an absolute masterpiece, I thought. Just the way that it projected this surrealistic world. I love the intro scene with the seance and this voyage up to this decrepit Scottish lighthouse. 
everything with how he took the story to the end with this duality construction of pleasure and pain, as well as the triplicate systems and how it breaks down into this weird mathematical construction. Plot-wise, it was a little all over the place with the episodic elements, but I think that while I wanted to spend some more time with some of these characters, I'm at the same time glad I got to see a wide range of the world, and I think it really all came together very well at the end. Yes, and there will be a bit more to say to that about that, but my number two is The Repair of Reputations by Robert Chambers. All right. And we had a lot to talk about in that installment last time. Certainly a lot packed into this fairly short story. Yeah, definitely. And I loved not only the whole depiction of the play that can destroy people's minds and drive them insane, but also the world building around this future New York and what was happening in the world and specifically the USA at that time in this projected 1920 that Chambers came up with. Yeah. And there were interesting sort of resonances with Napoleon and other things that I didn't necessarily pick up on the first time that I read the story. And uh, other, just the the sheer depiction of a very frightening sort of insanity, really. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Where it's all in a person's way of perceiving things. And like, you can't, you couldn't convince somebody like that, that they're wrong. Right. Because they're so assured in their convictions. Like they actually feel like they're, more in control of themselves than anybody else is in control of themselves. So how could you, they would pity you if you told them that they were the the crazy one and Mm. they might just kill you. Yep. So, and it was just, and there was, there was this, so again, kind of like the Mitchell story, there are a lot of questions that you are left with by the end, but the atmosphere was, was really eerie. And uh, there were really interesting eccentric characters like Mr. Wild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole underpinning of the King in Yellow and how much, how much it influenced not only the protagonist of the story, but perhaps the world at large that he inhabits. And all that stuff is sort of understated, but it's certainly there. Yeah. You know, like everybody from the beggar on the street who asks for money and he gives him a yellow sign instead. And he just kind of looks at it and puts it, puts it in his pocket. Like doesn't, kind of respond the way you might think that somebody would and then things like the suicide chambers and how destructive that sounds on a a social level to us now when we kind of feel like we care more about people's mental health right it's just yeah it's a very compelling story and it's it's definitely one of the best horror stories that i know of yeah for sure except for the postscript at the end but (laughs) yeah no this is my number one and i think that you know, understated is a good way to put it because it does feel very atmospheric in the sense that it's a very oppressive environment, but he doesn't really have this like poetic or flowery prose style. He right. has a lot of, he compresses a lot into not a lot of words. I mean, this isn't a very long story, but there's a lot going on here. And even some of the things like the names of the characters being kind of a reflection of their their personalities and trades like you know wild being this old man scarred up and scratched by a cat and the armor yeah. being named Halberk and uh, yeah. some of the other little touches in there that are kind of subtle in a way that I think a lot of the unreliable narration is you never really know exactly how much of the story is happening in the real world and how much is happening in the head of the main character. Cast, uh, Castane. Castane, yeah. yeah. And that's a really nice touch because it does leave you with a lot of questions. And those questions are really like unsettling. And I think that's the mark of a good horror story is something that really sticks with you after you read it. Yeah, I agree. And that this is definitely a story that will stick with anybody who reads it, I think, that's into this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think after I knock out the rest of The Dark Descent, I'm probably going to read the other King and Yellow stories, because I was really, really impressed with this one. Nice. They will definitely be interesting. I'm not sure that I like them as much as that one, but, like, all together, they do form a nice whole package, I think. Sure, yeah. And uh, and there's even the other stories in the book that are, they tie in with the war situation in Paris in in the 1870s. And that's quite interesting and and something that even if Chambers didn't have very direct experience of, like he was in Paris 
around the late 1880s, so he would have definitely seen some of the after effects and stuff like that. So it's an interesting read, definitely. So my number one has to be the one and only Voyage to Arcturus, which we've already talked about. Oh, yeah. But this book, I've read it a couple of times now, probably three times, I guess, including this time for the podcast. And it's just always stuck to me so much. Like, it's haunted me. Certain scenes, certain bits of, of, of dialogue between Masco and the characters. The ending has always left me feeling kind of unsettled and, like, not entirely happy, but, like, kind of... I, I kind of came a bit more to terms with it this time around, I guess. Yeah. I kind of didn't want to think... I mean, I mentioned it in the podcast, but I didn't really want to think of David Lindsay as this, like, super grim our person who is telling this telling us that we should like avoid pleasure because it's evil no and that's not the take i got away from it at all and i yeah. kind, of, kind of find some of the criticism that states that to be a little strange well, but right. i guess some criticism can be a little strange oh for sure yeah we're definitely finding finding that out yeah uh, <laughs> doing this product and yeah i think that's something that you learn with a lot of you know i think people have to be careful of that nowadays because there's so much out there right and you can just go on youtube and look for criticism of anything right right and you just have to be careful you can take stuff on board but you have to also use your judgment and your experiences and take away from that kind of stuff what's valuable and maybe just discard the things that you don't think apply because i mean it all comes from different people with their own mindsets and ideas and maybe some of these people like the guy that wrote the little thing about it in the cambridge book of science fiction you know he decided that David Lindsay didn't like sex and yeah um, right right I just yeah like that that was a kind of a trigger to me because I kind of thought about it and I'm like but he describes some things in a very sensual way like you can't just do that and be pretending the whole time yeah right exactly and, and <laughs> I felt even though I always loved the book I felt like sometimes it was trying to trick me and I think that that still maybe holds true but I don't think it holds true in this entirely completely dualistic bad good kind of way and it is there is more to it than that and i think that certain things like yes the sensuality but also the way he describes things affecting people like music yeah like that there is a certain honesty to that like there's a certain this isn't like the devil trying to trick you this is music this is like real something real that gets to the depths of your soul and even if it is like disharmonic there's still a power to it that needs to it needs to exist in a balance between maybe some harmony and some disharmony right yeah absolutely so yeah and, and of course right i love the the opening scenes as well it tied in very well with the episodes we'd done previously as well with the mesmerism oh yeah it was a great segue yeah it couldn't have been planned better <laughs> even though it all kind yeah. of came together like spur of the moment in a yeah. sense <laughs> yeah and i enjoyed the the mythological resonances with the Norse mythology and the Greek stuff and right. a little bit of the Christian Gnosticism, which is another thing that might be one of the centenary people that was talking about it. This really like super Scottish guy who is like going on about the Gnostic stuff and I'm like, yeah, I get it. I, I think I get it, but I'm not sure that's all. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that's all it is really. Yeah. Because like, yeah. uh, I don't know that, I mean, you know, the so-called Gnostic Gospels hadn't even really been discovered by 1920 and I right. mean, although there were a lot of previous writings and things like that that i'm sure influenced him i'm just not sure i, I think that there the, all the other sides of the book have to be taken into consideration oh, as yeah. well yeah and so i enjoyed reading it again and i i find Lindsay's style to be really interesting because like sometimes it can just turn on a dime and you see like little flashes of unexpected humor mm -hmm where like you don't necessarily expect it to come in and it just does and you kind of laugh a little bit and <laughs> other things like the way he describes senses both the ones that we know and the ones that are known only on torments is just incredible and you know it's so vivid and how somebody could just sit there and go i invented a couple of new colors here's what yeah, they're right. like it's like <laughs> yeah. oh wow that's <laughs> yeah. that's really something yeah yes. and, and he yeah. does it well also, I guess his life story is a little bit tragic and a little bit, like, compelling in the sense that, like, he wanted to be an artist and he struggled to be a writer and never really was able to, I mean, he was able to achieve it in the sense that he did get books published, but he never was able to really make a successful living of it. And you can tell it, he put a lot of his time and soul into it. 
and it was really what he wanted to do. And then he wasn't, he was kind of the opposite of somebody like H.G. Wells or Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, very much not a celebrity writer. Right. And I think that's a common story. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's our, our top 10 list. Yeah. No, a lot of great stuff we've covered, but I think, yeah, these, these are some really great ones that I would definitely encourage all of our listeners to check out. Now that we've talked about some of the fiction we've liked, let's talk about some of the nonfiction we've liked. Yeah, so I have three books that I just want to briefly mention. Uh, and of course, these are nonfiction, so it's not quite the same criteria, but I stopped reading nonfiction for a very long time before doing this podcast, mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, just because I think I just got tired of it, you know, after school and doing a lot of stuff with my old work, and I just, yeah, I just right. didn't really want to read nonfiction. <laughs> I found some of these to be enjoyable in their own way. And of course, they're fine sources of research for us. So we've been using various sources of interest and some of them are a bit dry. Some of them are pretty old and so interesting for that reason. There was a lot of interesting stuff on the mesmerism episode. Oh, definitely. Quite a bizarre little rabbit hole we went down with that. And, and I did find a lot of it interesting, but I'm not including any of those because I wanted to sort of turn towards more modern sources. The first book I wanted to mention was actually the Time Travel, a History book written by James Gleick, who I believe is a uh, mathematician of some kind. And uh, this book was published in 2016 by Pantheon. And it's a really good book if you are interested in sort of the mechanics of time travel, how it might work, a little bit of its history and fiction. And in a way that's done that not terribly mathematical, something that, that most people could probably understand quite well. But the book is written with a lot of humor. It's got some really fun analogies that he employs and different things uh, that he, he does to sort of bring his points across. And it was a really engrossing, actually quite fast read. So I really liked that one a lot. The second one I wanted to mention was an actual biography of... Arthur Conan Doyle, who only mm. really came up briefly in the Mesmerism episode, but we'll be revisiting him. Yes, a couple uh, times. And I just found that this biography was a lot more engrossing than I was expecting, and I didn't really read it cover to cover. Like, I stopped before most of the latter half of his life, just because it didn't really pertain to what we were doing at the time, and I had other stuff to read. But, I mean, it's the kind of book that I'll probably get back into, and the next Doyle we do will probably be a much later work, so I'll probably get back into reading it. Yeah. And probably can tell from that episode, because I did a, a bit more background of him than, than usual, I tend to kind of sketch over it sometimes, especially if it's just a short story or something and we're only going to be covering one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not really a lot of point in getting into the weeds with the biographies too much. But I just found this book to be really interesting, uh, and it told his life in a very fun way that was full of incident and anecdotes that were quite engrossing and amusing. So uh, this was Daniel Stashower's book, Teller of Tales, and this was published by Holt in 2001. And there is another biography of him that uh, we found, but I didn't like that one nearly as much. It, it seemed to more focus on him as the writer of Sherlock Holmes. Right. Whereas this this right. kind of seemed to come at it from the opposite angle. I mean, obviously, they, they did touch on, Stashower did touch on Holmes, but it, it was very much not from that angle. As yeah. not, not like, oh, this is what the one that all the Holmes fans want to read. Yeah, and as we've seen and we'll see, he wrote a lot of stuff that isn't Sherlock Holmes. Yes. And is, is quite buried in its nature. Right, exactly. And he didn't really want to be chiefly known as the Holmes guy. Right. But that's the way history works sometimes. Mm -hmm. So the third book is Hollow Earth, The Long and Curious History of Imagining Strange Lands, Fantastical Creatures, Advanced Civilizations, and Marvelous Machines Below the Earth's Surface. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a full nice title in the style of Journey Underground of Hans Klim there. Right. Kind of feels like it's aping that kind of old school title. Anyway, this was written by David Standish, and it was published by DeCapo Press in 2006. The title pretty much explains everything you need to know about this. This is uh, for those who are interested in the lore of the Hollow Earth and what it entails and where it may have started and where it's possibly going. 
will want to read this book. I think that I found myself in disagreement with the author on a couple of artistic points, like his movie criticism, maybe. But yeah. other than that, I can't really fault him. He did a really good job of researching the history of this and really oh, getting absolutely. into it. And there's yeah. individual chapters on, on various things that we actually covered in the episode. And there's a lot of unearthing of some very strange titles that he kind of summarizes and talks a little bit about. And, yeah, very uh, complete bibliography. Yeah, yeah. So that one was really good. And those are my three nonfiction recommendations. Cool. Yeah, I wanted to structure mine in three clusters rather than three books. So the first cluster is general reference works. So these are ones that we've consulted a lot throughout the course of these episodes. Namely, the Encyclopedia of Fantastic Victoriana by Jess Nevins and Science Fiction the Early Years, a full description of more than 3,000 science fiction stories by Everett F. Blailer. Those two are really, really good texts for if you want to do like an every story ever type approach, even if it just comes to browsing what's out there. Both of these works go really, really far into depth, as well as covering some of the tangential stuff to science fiction. And the other work I wanted to mention in conjunction with reference is Rachel Haywood Ferreira's The Emergence of Latin American Science Fiction, which I think is really like the gold standard of histories of a specific time period and place in that it really grounds the literature in the political context of the time as well as provides a comprehensive chronological bibliography of all the works that were published there. And I really wish we had a book like this for every country. It would certainly yeah, make some of the... Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> it would certainly make <laughs> yeah. some of the uh, research that we've done a lot easier. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. The, I guess, next cluster is a work by its own, and that's the 30,000-foot view of science fiction in general. And that comes in the form of Adam Roberts' book, The History of Science Fiction, from 2016. I talked a bit about this one briefly in the first bonus episode we did a while ago. But this is really good at going into a lot of the prehistory and discussing what we know and what we don't know in conjunction with lost works, as well as diving really deep into a lot of the stuff in the 1600s and 1700s for the obscure titles that haven't been translated into English yet. I think, as you mentioned with the Hollowworth book, there are places where I do disagree with the author's takes on some works, but that's just the nature of yeah. Being a fan and having an opinion. I mean, I've been reading the, the Brian Aldous book, Trillion Near Spree. And, yeah. and while the book is very well written and and his points are very good, I do find myself disagreeing with him a fair amount as well. So sure. he kind of presents a lot of his things in a very almost pugnacious way, like daring you to right. disagree with him. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That happens. <laughs> and I guess the last cluster of books I wanted to mention is the ones that I had the most fun in doing the background research, which are Anne Browd's Radical Spirits, Christine Ferguson's Determined Spirits, and Doyle's History of Spiritualism, which all really tie together. And I think for me, I really needed all three of them to kind of get the fuller picture to what the movement was about. But I had just so much fun digging into all the little odds and ends associated with the spiritualist background, uh, especially the publication that Annie Denton Cridge was involved with the Vanguard, oh, yeah. which is posted on that Association of Occult and Spiritualist Periodicals or whatever it was. We posted a link in the bibliography of the episode 10 where we covered Annie Denton Cridge's work. But Yeah, which is it's funny that she came up again in a completely unrelated area. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it's not that unrelated, I guess, but it, in a way it seems at first glance right. quite unrelated. Yeah, but that was just a fascinating rabbit hole to go down. Mm -hmm. All those books together in conjunction, I think, work really well. And Doyle especially has a really good narrative voice for this kind of thing, even though you pretty much have to take everything he says on the subject with a grain of salt or two. Yeah, yeah. He does have a way of just pulling you into it, into things, I think. Yeah. So, And especially, obviously, he was passionate about the subject, yeah, so it really absolutely. comes across. Yeah. So the next thing we wanted to do then, since we came out with a top ten and or, well, both of our top tens, and they were quite similar, especially going towards the, I guess, the top end, yeah. you might say. So we also decided to do a bottom five each, 
And this one for me was a little different. I found that whereas with the top 10, I was able to consider novels and short stories in the same category. Mm -hmm. It's a little harder with the ones that I didn't like so much. And what I found was leans more heavily on the longer works. Yeah, just because I, would say I so. think that it's harder to be offended by a bad <laughs> right. short story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you just, I mean, there was a few things that I considered, uh, especially when we did our first short story episode. I really didn't like them very much, but I just kind of thought, you know, they're so short. Right. Like, you just kind of shrug and go, well, that wasn't very good. And then you move on. And it's yeah, not right. really that big of a deal. Yeah. But if you're forced to read a 200 page work that like every page is kind of, kind of agony, then it's going to stick with you a lot more sure. in a negative way. So yeah. I will say that there's nothing that bad in what we've done, but there is some kind of bad stuff. So <laughs> I guess we can just do it just like last time. Yeah. But these are not really in order per se. I don't think. They might be, though, because this might be the least offensive one. So the first one on my list is, I'm cheating a bit because we did sort of do them as one work, but it's Round the Moon by Jules Byrne. Yeah, that is also my first pick on okay. mine, yeah, so yes. Yeah, I, they might be the same, uh, close to similar <laughs> yeah. also. But, but this was, yeah, like this was published after From the Earth to the Moon, and it continues on with the story of the men from the gun club, and although you would think it would be pretty exciting because they're actually going to their destination now, it's really just a few guys rattling around in a tin can with a quickly yep. dying dog. And yep. it's not yep. very good. <laughs> Everything I liked about the first one is missing from this. The humor is almost all gone. The plot doesn't really go anywhere. The science is pretty shaky. And it's, I guess, an early example of one of... The fatal flaws you can make being an author is that you write a totally unnecessary sequel to a book that doesn't need one. Yeah. Like, the way the first book ended was perfect. It was a great cliffhanger, but you didn't need to follow up on the characters. You're, yeah. you're fine leaving them like that because it's the end of this, like, ridiculous, bombastic satire on gun culture where everybody's literally blowing themselves up to get to that point. And the end, they blow themselves up in the biggest way possible. So you don't really need to trace what happens afterwards. And I think it really was a chore getting to the end of it. Yeah, thank the gods for the audio book. That's all I can say. <laughs> I just I just listened to it and it was a little more bearable because I could sort of do other things. And uh, right. I didn't have to summarize it, which also helped. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was not that great to to get through, unfortunately. Yeah. So that was both of our number five picks. So yeah. my next pick then is Steam Man of the Prairies by Edward S. Ellis. Okay. This was obviously an important work. Yeah. And it had its interest, but it really wasn't good. No, it wasn't. The plot goes nowhere in this one, and it just has these racist overtones to it that just make it an uncomfortable read. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, <laughs> I did download the complete Edward Ellis collection, and there's some titles there that seem like they might be interesting. Uh huh. But I mean, I'm not, you know, I'll just read, maybe glance through them quickly, and if any of them we decide to cover later, we might, but I mean, it might not be worth it because yeah. this guy just seems like a writing by numbers sort of. No, for sure. He cranked out like what, 200 dime novels or something like that? Right. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I guess and, as you might get to the scenario of. You know, a bunch of monkeys with a bunch of typewriters over time will produce Shakespeare. <laughs> a masterpiece whatever, but... might emerge. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh... yeah. I don't know. So it might be possible <laughs> that there's something good that's worth reading. Yeah. This book was very influential as like one of the very first dime novels. And yeah. also, of course, the the automatic steam man angle, which is pretty neat, I guess. And also the boy inventor, Yeah, which is a staple of science fiction. Nowadays, it's still kind of a thing. Uh, I think you find it in, in YA fiction a lot. Like, sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Artemis Fowl and stuff like that. You yep. know, they, they did all into that stuff. So, But yeah, that's my number four. Yeah, my number four was The Blazing World by Margaret Cavendish. There yeah. was a lot that I thought was interesting about this, but the way that it was written in this like very stilted and dry philosophy-type language made it very difficult for me to get into. There were some cool ideas and some interesting imagery, but overall, I really had a tough time getting through this one. Yeah, I did too. It was I didn't I didn't include it in my list, but I really thought about it. Yeah, 
it was a toss up between that and 300 years hence from mm -hmm. the feminist works. And yeah. I actually didn't include that one either. And I think I just, I think I just sort of forgot about it. Like yeah. I probably would have put this one in there because it's longer. Yeah. And I had a much more difficult time reading this than 300 years hence, even though 300 years hence, it wasn't great. And it took some really weird turns towards the end. Yeah. It was a pretty painless read. I thought, and some of the stuff yeah. it did cover was interesting, but yeah. I think it just started out well, and then it didn't live up to that. And I right, think that which can always be frustrating in a story, is you want it to be constantly good throughout, and sometimes it just right. does feel like a waste of potential. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I didn't actually write that one down either, so I guess we'll just move on to the next one then, which for me is Simsonia by Sims. Uh, do right. I believe Sims? <laughs> So we talked a lot about this book, and we spent probably more time on the authorship question than on the book itself. Yeah, and honestly, that was more interesting than the book itself, I thought. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that there's a good argument to be made for that. This felt like something written by somebody who had no real interest in being a novelist. Right. So, and that's pretty much, I think, what it was. Yeah. It doesn't have the verve or the passion that other sea adventures, I think, have. And the utopian stuff is really not interesting. No, it's incredibly dull. And yeah. the the prose is clunky. Nothing happens. It feels like it's building to something at some point, but it just never gets there. And yeah, and the humor is not great. Yeah, it's if, if, if at present all. at all. I mean, there's, <laughs> there, there's some flashes of it here and there, but some of the crit that describes it as this, like, satire of sims's ideas that like ribaldly skewers it or something like that it just seems to me so far from what the text actually is it just makes me wonder yeah. like, where where they get that from they may not have read it yeah right well that's <laughs> we read our books yeah <laughs> so yeah simsonia is number three yeah, so my number three was team man of the prairie so i think we said pretty much of all about that so my number two unfortunately I have to say it, is in your knickknack by Eduardo Holmberg. Holmberg. Yeah. Yes. It's a, it's a tough one, and it's a very obscure one. And even though I did like this one, I could see why there'd be some issues. And Yeah, I just found it very, very hard to get through. Yeah. I, I just started to get so exasperated with having to reread sentences just to know what they were trying to say. <laughs> right. And that's, you know, again, it's not, I don't think that's your fault. I think that's just yeah, though, work and the way he does things. Yeah, certainly my translation is not going to be the definitive one. But, I mean, it might be unlikely that the definitive one never comes out in English, or, or at least doesn't for a really long time. And I think one of the reasons that I wanted to do this is I wanted to really interface with some of the stranger stuff that might not be accessible otherwise. And, I mean... At least with a fan translation, you could kind of get the gist of like what's going on in the yeah. story. But certainly, it's not going to be a perfect translation. I'm sure there's some obvious flaws with it. And certainly, if you can understand Spanish, it'd be much preferable to just read it that way. Read, but, read the Spanish, sure. Yeah, yeah but I it, still it's don't. obtuse. It's definitely obtuse. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just very meandering, like episodic, but not in a fun way, like. Arcturus was. Yeah. Or even Niels Klim was. Kind right, of. right. It's just, I don't understand where the author is going or coming from half the time. <laughs> it just, it feels obscure, not only in the sense that it's not well known, but the intentions and purpose of it are very difficult to define. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't really feel like I got much from it at all. Yeah. So uh, that's my second pick. All right. Second to last pick, I should yeah. say. Next one up for me, second to last, is Simsonia. Again, yep. very dry and dull. The authorship mystery was more interesting than the book. And it's kind of a shame because Sims sounds like he was a really weird crackpot figure. And the mystery surrounding him and his ideas that permeate through his relatives over the next 75 years or whatever, I, I think it's just yeah. fascinating. But this was dull stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what do you got for the bottom? All right, well, like I said, it's not necessarily in any order, so I'm not going to say that this was necessarily worse, especially than Simsonia or Nick Knock. But my last pick is, I'm afraid, The Romance of Two Worlds by Marie Corelli. Really? This was a really interesting book, and there was a lot to say about it. But again, yeah. I, I really can't say that it was good. It's interesting because there's that much to talk about. Yeah. Because it did generate a lot of discussion, and 
it did make me think a fair bit about stuff and make me wonder what her other books were like. But the message and the overall, the overall, I guess, way that I could feel, I could feel the book going as it was going there. I didn't want it to go there because, I mean, in the beginning, I was yeah. like, oh, that's cool. You know, what's right. this, this weird cultish guy and his electric cult and stuff? Okay, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll go along with this. And right. I mean, I, a part of it might be my modern expectations of like, wow, well, we've had so much exposure to cults in fiction and in real life. And we're like, oh, yeah, this this guy's got to be up to no good. And I wanted it to go in a horror direction. And it right. Didn't. But I don't think it's just that. I just, I think that there's also a certain amount of like, pompousness in the way oh, she yeah, yeah, for comes sure. across yeah. you know and it's just sort of irritating yeah <laughs> see i found that kind of entertaining and this yeah. one is one that i it definitely would never call this a good book but i had fun reading it i i really did this was never a chore for me and even I guess though you're right i mean yeah the the message was kind of silly and trite and she is kind of overbearing in times with the social conservatism i i, I was amused i was entertained by reading this one yeah well, I guess I was too. I mean, I think by the end, I want, I just wanted to be done. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> it did take a while for me to get there. So yeah, right. I will say that. So, you know, I mean, I guess you could exchange this one for something that I didn't include, like The Blazing World, which is not very entertaining. No, I mean, it's about the gut feeling, you know? I mean, there, there's no right or wrong. There's no nothing set in stone. No, uh, no. You know, it's all subjective. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, we'll just say that uh, all of these, including the honorable mentions, I was not all that into. So, yeah, that's my that's my five there. Is yeah. what's your last pick? It is Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. Oh. I think everything oh. I said about Simzonia applies doubly here where it's just an incredibly dull utopia that really really gets in the weeds of obscure religious stuff that unless you're a scholar of Reformation era is probably not going to be interesting at all to read. I thought this yeah. was just a chore from start to finish, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it was that bad, but again, it, a part of it might be just the way I was taking it in. That was another one that I listened to, and I right. think that maybe made it more bearable. Yeah. Because it does take me a long time to read stuff, and if I feel like I'm not having a good time, it takes longer. Yeah. So uh, that might have been a part of it. I. I Oh, I'm not going to say it was a, a, a something that I would ever come back to, but I didn't. It was short enough that I didn't really like have abject distaste toward it. I think. Yeah, I, I yeah, I don't know. This one just rubbed me the wrong way, mm. and I think if anybody else other than Francis Bacon wrote this, it would have probably fallen into obscurity, and nobody would be reading this today. True. There were some cool inventions in it, though. Yeah, there, uh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I'm sticking up for him, but you know, it was, it's, uh, yeah, no, yeah, it wasn't very good. Yeah. <laughs> so that's our list. And we all like lists now. I'm spending a lot of time on YouTube and everybody does lists there. Yeah. And Great place for like, it. Like I wouldn't follow that example, except it's pretty fun. So it's exciting to see, exciting to see what people will come up with and get some debate going and people argue for or against something that they just kind of interesting. So, yep. So those are our lists. And we'll probably do this again, maybe in another year. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we, we got um, a lot of plans for the upcoming year and the, I guess, years to come. Yeah, so let's get into that briefly. Sure. I want to talk a bit about, without really giving too much away, what are some of the themes that we're going to be covering? Before we maybe break away from the thematic ideas a little bit and kind of move on to a more story-based approach and just sort of tackle things a little differently, I think we have a lot of themes that we still want to cover. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We put together a number of episodes that are theme-based, and I think what we really want to do for the next, I don't know, six or seven episodes or so, is really take care of these tropes and themes that you really only see in the 19th century, and not too much going forward into the 20th century, because at some point, some of the stuff does change from science fiction and speculation to science reality and everyday life, like we're doing with the next episode regarding the airplane and air travel. You know, this mm -hmm. was not a thing that happened in 1900, even though we take it for granted today that you can just hop on an airplane and be halfway around the world in 10 hours or whatever. Yeah. And that, that really shaped a lot of the literature around the time. And there are some other tropes and themes that 
fall under the same thing of in the 19th century, they weren't exactly fleshed out into reality yet, but were clearly speculated about. So once we take care of those, I think we're going to move into more tropes that you see developed in the 19th century. We're not going to say goodbye to the 19th century altogether, but are still relevant to modern science fiction. Like you see aliens in a lot of modern science fiction. You see going to Venus in a lot of modern science fiction. So we're going to be covering a lot of that stuff going forward, as well as I think interjecting various episodes of comparing one or two works together with one another, like we did with Voyage to Arcturus and Out of the Silent Planet, because I think that format worked really well. Yeah, It might not necessarily be thematic in a way, but two books that have at least some kind of connection with one another. Right. And I think the way we do it, where we, we kind of cover something that's a little bit more popular and something that may be not so popular yeah. is a good approach. And as much as you do see people referring to Voyage to Arcturus nowadays, like it's still not a very regarded book compared with C.S. Lewis. Sure. Yeah. I think we'll be doing that again. And I think maybe we'll be also finding things to compare classic science fiction in English to that are, in fact, works that were originally produced in other languages. Right. So that's something that I'm certainly looking forward to Yeah. as, as we go forward. Yeah, we've got the airplane, we've got the submarine, we've got more stuff to do on artificial people and intelligence. We have stuff on body modification. We have an episode in the works about telegraph and radio transmissions. <laughs> That'll be a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's a lot more, a lot more coming. Yeah. So uh, we have a lot planned. We're going to be planning to stick around for a while. So yeah, we're, we're going to get to as much as we can. And we've really enjoyed sticking to this time period. And we're definitely going to be focusing more on stuff from the 20s and the 30s in episodes coming yeah forward. i think we're slowly very slowly in a roundabout way sort of inching our way forward yeah, yeah. we've gotten to we did do out of the silent planet which is sort of the, the sudden burst into the 1930s but <laughs> right. like i kind of count green star almost as our latest work in the sure. sense that like they felt almost like our latest work oh yeah like it, it felt definitely like, felt more of like a 50s story right exactly and that was from 1925 so definitely we're going to be sort of slowly introducing more stuff from the 30s as we go not sure when we'll get to later stuff but eventually i definitely have some great golden age type things in mind i do want to cover some of the the well-known american luminaries like maybe one day we'll do an arthur c clark book mm -hmm. maybe and maybe some asimov short stories i would like to cover i think that maybe staying away from asimov novels would be okay yeah but I, I, I'm with that. you know he's done some great short stories so yeah. and and i'd said many times before that that's one of my favorite forms so i think that if some of these authors like uh like asimov are going to come into this uh it might well be in the short story format but i am yeah. considering a longer at least one or two longer arthur c clark works so i think those may come probably not for a while yet but they'll come we'll get there all of stapleton is definitely coming yep there will be like we said more wells there will be at least one more Vern book Probably two. At least two. Yeah, we're going to revisit Edward Pate Mitchell, who only wrote short stories. Right. And we'll also be tackling some interesting stuff by some other classic writers. Roger Kipling's coming up very soon, and he's certainly not somebody who's generally associated with the field, but we'll be covering two stories that are going to be, I think, quite interesting and tied in with the aviation theme. Sure. As well as plenty more obscurities, and we're going to try to bring as much of a global perspective as possible, including more translations of Latin American and Spanish stories that we have already done that are in progress. And yeah, we have a whole whole bunch of stuff coming up. So we're excited to get to it, and we're excited to present it to you all. Yes. So please stay with us and tell your science fiction-loving friends and, of course, we're going to be dipping a little bit into other genres, too, as we sort of see fit. We're sneaking a lot of horror stories into the mix, and they're all sort of science fiction adjacent, but I think we all kind of like that sort of stuff, too. Oh, and absolutely, yeah. The two do go together very well. I mean, yep. a lot of people talk about H.P. Lovecraft and, and how, yes, he's known as a horror writer, but it's almost like his stories were becoming more and more science fictional as he went on. Mm -hmm. Towards the end there in 1937... I think that at most of the stories he could be writing around that time would have been like equally considered 
science fiction. Sure. So yeah, and and something like the repair of reputations again has these little science fiction twists to it that make it more interesting, but certainly falls into the horror genre. So we may uh, do the same thing with fantasy. Like some science fantasy stuff is not out of the uh, out of the question. Oh, absolutely not. So yeah, I mean, yeah, Green Star was leaning a little bit that way. I thought. Yep. But it was more science fiction than not, which I thought was interesting because yeah. I think most of his stories go the other way. Right. Right. But somebody like Clark Ashton Smith or even Robert E. Howard, those guys are not out of the question. So, nope. and we did Burroughs. We'll be coming back to him mm-hmm. at some point, doing at least the first Mars book. So. Stay tuned, and yes, please tell your friends, and definitely, if anybody has feedback for us, we'd love to hear from you. Yep, absolutely. We appreciate you listening, and we're just having a lot of fun doing this podcast, and we hope you're having a lot of fun listening. Yeah, so that's it for bonus episode number two. Cheers, everyone, and good night. See you in a couple weeks. Have a good night. Good night.